Hadi is joining us from California. It's eight o'clock in the morning for him, so we have to say good morning to him, and he's going to bid us good night. Sorry for my poor jokes. Um, I have to say, you know, a lot of the kids might not have known you, Hadi, but they all have used your coding platform, Code.org, and I want to share a fun fact about you to them: that Hadi grew up in the Iranian Revolution, and he created two revolutions of his own. A, he had a vision that every child should be given an equal chance to learn to code, which is why he created Code.org. Two, he believed that coding should be accessible to everyone, which is how the art of code was born. A one-hour capsule, which makes people realize that how cool and fun it is to learn to code. The other vision that Hadi had has is that coding is a fundamental skill that every child should learn. Like math, English, science, it should be a compulsory subject in school. There is so much to learn from you, Hadi. So I'm now going to let you tell all, all, us all about your visions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I don't know how long I can just talk and keep people's attention. So if there's questions people have, I might talk a little bit and then give give it up for questions. I'd say yeah. a couple things. Um, yeah. First of all, Ed. Uh, you know, I'm in a, such a lucky place to be creating technology and creating an education platform that has reached, you know, hundreds of millions of students. Uh, it's kind of a life dream. But growing up in Iran, when I was the age of most of you on the screen, I lived in Tehran, Iran. Uh, the country was going through a war. Uh, my neighborhood was getting bombed almost every night. Uh, it was a police state with tanks outside the window all the time. Uh, and soldiers holding mach machine guns marching around. So to, to consider that I've now, thanks to my knowledge of computer science, been able to create something like code.org that has uh, has reached every country, every city in the world, uh, just shows the power of dreaming big and also the power of learning how to use technology. So uh, no matter where you are, the, the next century is gonna unlock opportunities that you don't imagine because of technology. Uh, it's something that has connected us and made our very large world feel a little bit smaller. Uh, and the next generation of students who know not only how to use technology, but how to create it and understand how it works. Uh, is, this is basically the superpower of this century. And it's something that I believe every student should at least have the opportunity to learn in their schools. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is um, the reason we teach computer science, which is more than just coding. Right now, you might be learning how to move forward and turn right and move things with code. But computer science also means how to use computers to analyze data. How does machine learning and artificial intelligence work? How to protect computer systems against cybersecurity attacks? Uh, how does software control robots? All of these things are mixed. Um, but the reason to teach it isn't just because you could get a job as a coder or as a cybersecurity technician. Th these are the best paying jobs in the world and, and there's a shortage of them. But if you wanna become a doctor, the future of medicine is being decided and, and written by technologists. If you wanna become a farmer, I don't know how many of you wanna become farmers, but maybe some of you do. If you wanna become a farmer, the future of farming is with tractors that drive themselves and that scan the leaves of, that they're driving over and apply the right medicines to them. You know, if you want to become an artist, the future of art is, and especially the future of how art is sold, but it is, is very much deeply intertwined with technology. And, and that's all form of art, especially music, but also movies. There's almost no field of study at, from sports to architecture to zoology. The study of birds is being done with computers. So knowing how technology works is relevant no matter what you want to get into uh, and understanding how to use it. Um, yeah. Uh, kids, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, Hadi. Sure, no, I, I'm ready to answer questions. That, that, that'll make it easier for me. Don't be shy. Um, so the... Mahib said, there's often a question in everybody's mind that AI will get too powerful and take over the world sometime in the future. Do you think that is a possibility and that artificial intelligence will turn into something bad that will be more powerful than us in the future? Um, that's a really good question. Um, 
at best, nobody knows, so it's just guessing because that's too far away in the future to predict. It's, it's relatively easy to predict technology trends that are two to five years out, but what you're asking about is probably 10 to 30 years out, and it's hard to know. Uh, already machine learning and artificial intelligence does things that is more powerful than us on computational tasks. There's lots of things where computers have been better than humans for, for many years. They've been much better at doing math, for example. If you want to add up a lot of numbers, a computer is a, a billion times better than you, than you at doing that. Um, and now computers have become better at recognizing patterns. So facial recognition, for example, uh, but any kind of patterns in, in data, uh, computers have become better at, at doing. But the thing that really makes a difference is when does a computer get its own consciousness or preferences? You know, the idea that a computer is going to be taking over the world suggests that it has its own awareness of itself. Uh, and right now we're so far from that, people don't even know how to define what that means, let alone how to create it. Uh, and in fact, philosophers argue about what it even means to be conscious. Uh, but what is much more relevant right now is computers and these computer algorithms having unintended consequences not because the computer is evil, but because the people who programmed it didn't realize what would happen. So for example, the, the, probably the most obvious example of this is how Facebook has led to the spread, Facebook and, and other social media platforms have led to the spread of disinformation and false news. So, you know, nobody intended that. Nobody wanted to build a platform that becomes the top way that, that sort of tr trustworthy news gets destroyed. But but that happened because computer algorithms made it happen. Um, and I asked, how did you get into coding? I got into coding uh, when I was roughly your age. My dad brought home a computer, a Commodore 64, which back then was the top of the line machine. Right now, a computer that strong is, is tinier than a grain of sand. <laughs> uh, but I had nothing better to do living in Iran during the war. So I learned from a book. And learning to code involved just typing uh, there was no dragging and dropping. The graphics weren't good at all. Uh, but the fact that it did what I wanted to do uh, at a time of war when nothing else was going the way I wanted it to was, was really powerful. Um, Sundar is saying AI is more important than fire and elec electricity. What are my thoughts on this? Um, you know, today, I think AI is more important than fire. But if you look at the historical role of fire and electricity, it's hard to imagine us getting us as the human race where we are without them. Uh, I, but I think it's good to at least consider that it, it is going to be at a similar scale of impact. Uh, I think it's really hard to compare <laughs> what, what, what changed the world more. And certainly we wouldn't have had uh, AI without electricity and we wouldn't have had electricity without fire. So, you know, I think the, the root things that impact the world are the more important ones. Um, somebody asked, um, out of everything in computers, why did coding uh, fascinate you? Uh, I loved computer graphics. So trying to make things that look like the real world, what you see, the, the CGI, computer graphics, uh, or computer generated uh, graphics that you see in movies. I wanted to know how to do that myself because I could see it and I wanted to know how it was built and it combined uh, computer programming with physics and the physics of light in particular. Uh, the, the intersection of physics and math and computer science is computer graphics. So anytime you see a movie and there's a computer generated monster or hair or water or a mirror, uh, you know, the ocean, any of those things, if it's computer generated, that means somebody is using the computer to calculate the physics of how that substance should look and how light bounces off of it. Uh, and so this brought together fields that I really liked. Um, somebody asked, how did I escape the war and create this amazing technology, um, Anjali? Uh, there was a lot in between there. Uh, I, I left the war when I was 11 and code.org was when I was in my 40s. So there's a lot in between. Um, but I would say the thing that's true across both of them is persistence and not giving up. Uh, 
And this is something that I think computer programming teaches people because when you have a bug, but you know, when you're solving a math problem and you get it wrong, your teacher just says it's wrong. And it, you know, then you're like, all right, I scored badly. Whereas on a computer problem, when you get it wrong, it's not the teacher, it's first the computer that tells you it's wrong. And then you have to try again and try again and try again until you get it right. Uh, and so when you learn to program computers, it becomes kind of, you, get your, you build up your own drive to fix your bugs and to get past them. Uh, and that's a, a large part of both what helped me and my family leave Iran and be successful in between and then create code.org. Um, as uh, Aisha asked, is AI balanced? Like there will be too much AI so that it makes people super lazy? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, the, the history of humanity has been a history of using technology to make us do less work. You know, think about Sundar talking about fire and electricity. There was a time where every human being needed to walk for miles and miles and miles and collect berries just to eat the food that they were going to eat that day. And now you can sit and food is brought to you from a farm where, you know, maybe there's workers, but maybe there's machines doing the farming for you. Um, or, or the fact that we have cars instead of walking. Uh, the invention of the wheel meant that we didn't always need to walk. We could have an animal pulling us and we're sitting on something with wheels. The, the history of technology has made humans more and more lazy, as you would say. Um, but that, that hasn't meant that people have stopped working. It means the type of work we do is less about our muscles and more about our minds. Uh, and that's what's gonna continue happening. AI is gonna reduce the types of work that don't use your minds or the types of work that use your mind in just sort of really boring ways, uh, repetitive ways. If something's really repetitive in your mind, AI is gonna be able to do it pretty well. And it's, it's invention that is still gonna be uh, the, the power of humans. Um, multiple people said, can we make our own apps on code.org? Uh, and yes, you can. You, you can use a part of code.org called App Lab uh, that is designed for making apps. And uh, so if you Google App Lab, A-P-P-L-A-B, uh, or if you go to code.org slash App Lab, uh, that's the part that makes, makes it possible to build anything you want. There's other tools for doing that as well, such as Sprite Lab or Game Lab, uh, but the most powerful of those is App Lab. Uh, if you're still doing drag and drop coding, our Sprite Lab tool makes it easy to, to make your own uh, games and things like that. Abe asked, how have I been coping with COVID-19? Um, it's not been easy. Uh, I think we've all just been locked up, but technology makes it a lot easier. The world went through a pandemic like this a hundred years ago. And back then, the only way people could get around was with horses. Uh, most people didn't have even telephones to call each other. Uh, it was a lot more lonely then. The fact that you can zoom into a call with people halfway across the world uh, has made us a lot more connected and has made this uh, situation much more bearable. So it's so even though it's tough and it's a struggle, it's good to remember that we have much, much better than the, the last pandemic that came around. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, somebody said computer algorithms allow social media to spread disinformation. Do I think that AI in the wrong hands can possibly be exploited even more? And can governments use this to identify and arrest protesters? And what action do you think should be taken against this? Um, so that's a really great question. Um, AI or not, computer technology and all technology can be used for bad. Uh, you know, and my favorite example of this is dynamite. When dynamite was invented, it wasn't invented to, to you know, create bombs. It was invented to break mountains, to create roads, and to make it easier to make buildings. But dynamite as a technology and explosives in general have, have been used for, to create a lot of harm. Uh, and in fact, if you've heard of the Nobel Prize, uh, it was created by a guy named Nobel who invented explosives. And then he saw that his invention was being used for bad things. And, he, and the money he got from his invention was something that he basically said for the rest of his life and the rest of history, 
that money should be used to give prizes to people who come up with either new inventions or people who basically help with world peace. Uh, so technology has always been used for good or bad. It's a double-edged sword and it depends on how you use it. And that's one of the more important lessons you all should learn. AI is not any different. Uh, so it's, you know, search engines could also be used for bad uh, in the wrong hands. You can use a search engine to find bad content. Uh, so technology is always has, has a good side and a bad side. And that's partly why it's important to understand because lawmakers don't know how to regulate it. They don't know how to write the laws because they don't understand it because they didn't have classes like you did uh, to help them even understand what's going on with technology. There are so many questions that I'm going to be out of time. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, um, um, somebody asked, how can we code AI algorithms which are not socially biased? Because when coders are biased, algorithms also become biased. Wow. Um, that's a great, great question, Ishita. Uh, now with AI, what's important to know is you're not coding the algorithm. Um, in other words, when you write most code, you tell the program exactly what to do. Go here, then go there. And if this happens, do that thing. And if this other thing happens, do this thing. Um, when you're programming AI, you're just giving the computer data and asking it to learn from that data. Like you could give it the data of different people's uh, skin color and how successful they are growing up. And then it can create a prediction algorithm for success. Now, that prediction algorithm might show that people with a darker skin might be more or less successful or that people who are women might be more or less successful. What you're giving it is just historical data of what has happened in our world. And the farther back you go in world history, the more unfair things have been and unequal things have been. And then you're teaching the computer inequality. And then the computer can then say, oh, this person is not going to be successful because they're female or because of some other reason. You know, um, and that's not that you're necessarily passing on your personal bias in your code. It's that the data of society is itself biased because society has been biased. So, for example, and this happens in the real world, because, for example, you might want to have AI that calculates when should a criminal be released by jail from jail? When is it safe to release them after they finish their jail time? You know, and that AI can have uh, built in bias or who should get a loan, who's most likely to pay back their loan, or who's a good job candidate. You know, these are all things that people are actively training AI to do, but the data that they're using to do it, they're not coding it to say, oh, like this group is bad. They're just saying, look at all the employees we've hired, who turned out good, who turned out bad. Maybe AI can now do that for us. But if we were racist or biased or sexist when making those decisions, in the past, then AI will just say, oh, turns out this group isn't a good type of employee um, because it learns from how we've behaved. So it's, it makes it really important when programming machines or when providing the data that programs machines to make sure that that source of data is itself not unfair. And that's probably one of the most important areas uh, of technology to learn as a group. All right, I'm out of time officially, so I'm going to stop with the Q&A, uh, okay. but no, uh, yeah. Sorry, Hadi, you know, thank you so much. You know, kids, you know what we can, what we'll do is we'll email you. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So the kids don't feel that, uh, you know, some of the questions have gone unanswered and when Hadi has time, he'll answer us back. Is that okay? And I'd like to thank you on behalf of all the children here for, you know, giving us your invaluable time. I want to tell you, Hadi, that we all want to be change makers like you and join you and try and make AI as accessible to all the children as you have done for coding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your hackathon and have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Guys, did you enjoy that?